Good morning, everyone, and happy Tuesday. Um, thanks for joining our webinar. We're going to give everyone a couple of minutes uh, to join in. We're slowly adding more attendees. Um, so let's give it uh, two, three minutes, and then we will get started. Thanks again. Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Um, I think we have most of our registrants uh, who have joined the uh, the webinar, so let's get started. Um, my name is Karen. I'm with uh, uh, C3. I um, want to welcome everyone to, CMM, to our webinar um, on CMMC. Um, it's coming soon. Uh, we're joined today with Bill Wooten with C3 Integrated Solutions and Christina Reynolds with BDO. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first off, you all do have the ability to ask questions. There is a um, portion uh, on your screen there will, that will allow you to submit questions. Um, we'll hold questions until the end, um, although you can post questions whenever you would like during the course of the webinar. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end when Bill and Christina will both be able to answer. Um, also, we'll be doing a survey at the very end of the webinar. So once the webinar concludes, if you could still leave your browser open for just a second, you'll see then that survey pop up and we would definitely appreciate your responses. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to turn things over to Bill and Christina for their introductions. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, Christina, you want to go first? Uh, oh, Bill, on... you're muted. Um, I can oh. hear him. Yeah, I'm good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. All right, Christina, you, you want to start off good. as an introduction? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Christina Reynolds. I'm the director for BDO's Industry Specialty Services, which is really a fancy name for everything that's GovCon, state and local, and nonprofit. Um, what we do inside of Industry Specialty Services Group uh, is we provide a lot of GovCon consulting. And specifically, my group provides consulting for all things cyber, and that includes CMFC and NIST 800-171. Uh, we do consulting for risk management framework and 853, FedRAMP and ISO 27001. Uh, you name it, we pretty much provide the full gamut of 
information assurance, cybersecurity consulting, systems architecture, and documentation to provide a full package approach. My specific background in the industry, I've spent 22 years specializing in this industry, both in IT and cybersecurity. I have a master's degree in cybersecurity and information assurance with a number of industry certifications from uh, CEH to CHFI to CNDA, all through the EC Council uh, program. And I have worked in and out of the DOD for 25 years of my career, um, being a senior engineer for the DOD in technical communications, um, providing information assurance support for DOD programs, and also for support for industry that's in the DOD uh, DIB. Bill? Awesome. Thank you, Christina. It's so great to have you back. It's, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. My name is Bill Wooden. I'm president of C3 Integrated Solutions. We are a, a IT services provider that really focuses on helping our clients get compliant and stay compliant with CMMC and NIST 800-171. That starts with kind of picking up the ball from where Christina does a lot of her consulting, helping to put together a full strategic plan from a technology-based perspective, deploying that and then actively managing it uh, throughout the life cycle for our clients. Uh, we've been working in the in the DoD space and in particular uh, building our solutions around the Microsoft Cloud and things like GCC and GCC High for several years now. We've actually been in GCC High for over five years now. So deep experience in that space on the practical side of what it takes to deploy these services as well as be able to maintain them and manage them on a day-to-day -day basis. So. With that, uh, let's get started. Uh, today's format is going to be somewhat, uh, somewhat a little bit casual. We are going to run through some slides to use as a basis of our our, our conversation. And kind of starting off, Christina, let's let's talk a little bit about what's what's the latest with CMMC. I feel like we've we've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Some things are breaking loose. There, there's a sense that there's some movement now. Let's talk a little bit about what those latest updates are. Can you fill us in? Sure. So we know that originally back in 2020, we started with CMMC 1.0 um, and it has changed a lot since then. 1.0 was originally kind of built on the foundation of a capability maturity model. It looked a lot more like CMMI, which we had seen uh, developed for the software engineering industry. Um, when the DOD took ownership of it as of February of this year, however, a lot of things changed in that program. Um, starting with CMMC 2.0. And when they released 2.0, everything had to go back through a formal rulemaking process, which normally takes 24 months to complete that process to final rulemaking. However, in that duration, we can see an interim rule um, come out fairly quickly within a year, uh, as we saw it last time with CMMC 1.0. Um, what we saw and what I anticipate with CMMC 2.0, um, I anticipate the same thing that we saw with 1.0, which was um, we're going to see the interim rule come out and probably be put into some new uh, acquisitions programs not existing, um, and it'll probably be put into a number of pilot programs first. Um, we always want kind of a test run to see how things are going for any given program. CMMC should be no different. Uh, so we know that it was released in December of 2021. We anticipate that full, full rulemaking process will take the full 24 months. They have stated, and they also stated in a meeting we had with the RPs yesterday, while they've stated the interim rule is anticipated to come out between March and May, yesterday they said the DOD is now mums the word on any other information given. They are told they're not supposed to say anything more from this point, so all they're going to give us is between March and May. Does that mean it's going to hit everybody's contracts? No. Again, I anticipate it's going to be probably a, a small number of test contracts. However, if you're a subcontractor on those, number one, it's going to be new contracts coming out. Number two, um, you may inherit it through a flow down clause. So those are some of the things I'd keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that call you're referring to is the Cyber AB had a call for registered practitioners yesterday. And that 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 mums the word is just part of the process. When they get a certain point, they literally kind of put a little bit of a gag order on everything from a, from a government standpoint. That actually means things are happening and they're doing work behind the scenes and they've kind of decided, made a conscious decision 
no more outward conversations until we spring that rule on you, hopefully as soon as next March as, as we kind of go through. So let's talk a little bit about what that means for, for folks out there in the contracting community. You know, what, what, would you, what would we expect them to see as that interim rule rolls through? And even once we get to that final rule, um, I, I, are we looking at kind of expecting a, that extended time to roll things out or, and do you think that'll be new contracts or are they going to try to back it into existing contracts as well? Yeah, I think um, definitely the first thing uh, are you need to be aware. They have said explicitly that if CMMC is going to appear in your contracts, you will see it as early as the RFI and, and solicitation. So you will get a heads up. Um, they have also said that they're only intending on putting it in new contracts, not sliding it into your existing contracts. I think that is a good move uh, by the DOD to acknowledge that, you know, let's let your current contracts run their course under what we issue to you and not slip any new FAR DFARS clauses in there somewhere midway, which is very confusing to uh, the defense contractor. Um, what are your obligations now versus when the, the CMMC rule is applied? So if you have DFAR 7012 in your contract, you will continue to perform under that. Note that when CMMC 2.0 was released, what they have kind of honed it down into is the same requirements that you see in your DFAR 7012. So expect that the only difference here is DFAR 7012 is self-attestation. When you see CMMC appear, it means they expect some sort of certification to back up your self-attestation to the DFARS clause. So that's really moving forward. Only a C3PAO from the CMMC AB ecosystem is going to be able to provide that certification for you. Um, and, I, and we mentioned too that, you know, they have said explicitly, could they change their path? Certainly they could. Um, I don't think it's their intention to, based on the statements they've given us, um, that their intention is to put it into new contracts so that you you know prior to bidding the contract, hey, I'm going to have to have a certification to uh, get this contract award. And I think that's a good heads up. I think uh, all great info is always, I, I think it's also, you know, let's, we never want to forget about the fact that that obligation for 7012 is alive and well it's not going anywhere that's always at least as far as we know not going to change and it's been there for five years so this is not all completely new that requirement to put your 800-171 score in SPRS again still alive and well and still a thing for for contractors out there CMMC is going to be incremental to those two components as well uh so great um the next thing, um, kind of shifting gears for half a minute here, if, if for contractors and then for those who are C3PAO candidates, folks that want to be an assessor within the CMMC ecosystem, part of that process is going through your own internal validation of your environment with a group called the DIBCAC, that's a defense uh, a DOD organization that will come in and essentially assess you based on, I'll loosely say 800-171, want to take a minute and talk about that process because that's real that's alive there's people going through the pipeline now there's 20 plus or so that have successfully passed it unfortunately there's a fairly large number who have not passed it successfully uh our organization has been able to go through it twice now with with two of our clients as full msp clients and want to talk a minute for what to expect if you're in that bucket if you are a c3po candidate uh, that divcac assessment in a lot of ways is gonna parallel what we think CMMC assessments will eventually look like. There will be a scoping conversation that is well in advance of the assessment. And you've gotta really know what your system boundaries are, documentation, documentation, documentation. We'll talk about that through the course of this, what you need and what needs to be prepared. Have that down really solid. Also understand who your cloud vendors are and where they sit in terms of various authorizations like FedRAMP and other pieces like that. That preparation component for you as a candidate C3PAO is about making sure your documentation is aligned to your configurations. If your computer is programmed to go to sleep in 10 minutes, make sure your documentation doesn't say a different number that is less restrictive than that. Uh, make sure that you're, you're, you understand where your shared responsibility is for your vendors as well. 
if you have an MSP, if you have an SSP, if you have other folks that are performing IT services, make sure how those all interact with one another and make sure they're available for that assessment to support the event itself. And then also change control becomes a big deal as well. They will dig into how you are performing your change control, how you are documenting it, and how you are conducting risk reviews. Something that's, you know, something that seems relatively minor, still being able to track that through the process becomes important as you go through these processes. Once you get into that event, expected to be anywhere from three to five days long, they will loosely follow the assessment objectives of 171A, so that the 110 controls, but the 330 objectives that's, that kind of go around that. And they will look for examples. They will walk you through different scenarios. For example, moving, uh, adding a new user. Who's there to authorize it? How is that request tracked? How is that documented from a procedure standpoint? Do you collect evidence that it was done successfully? And then what does that user look like in their portal? Those types of scenarios, you will walk through various versions of that as you go through the event itself. Uh, and then it's from, from the follow-up standpoint, uh, there are delays. Um, we've got a couple folks go through that now. That post DIVCAC assessment into when you become certified, probably taking a little bit longer than anyone would like at this point. Uh, but for those that are in that candidate pipeline, you know this is what you're coming coming up on, and this is what you'll need to get passed before you get certified to be a C3PAO. So let's talk a little bit about voluntary assessments, which is kind of what got turned on last month uh, officially. Uh, Christina, tell us a little bit about what a voluntary assessment is and kind of who should be looking for that. Well, so I think, you know, first and foremost, let's define what a voluntary assessment is. It is essentially being one of the first candidates to select a C3PAO and elect to go through the CMMC certification follow-up process. Um, and the reason why it's called voluntary is because they haven't put it into contracts yet. So it's not a mandatory process as of right now. Um, next year when the interim rule comes out and they start with that first batch of pilot program contracts, um, you're probably going to see mandatory assessments come down the pike. And especially when we hit that flow down clause, we know anything that's in a FAR or DFARS clause has a mandatory flow down. Same with CMMC that will contain the mandatory flow down clause. So um, we're going to see a lot of uh, primes flow that requirement down to their subs if they're in those test pilot programs. Um, by the time the full rule comes out, you know, we're going to start seeing it in more and more programs. However, until you see it in yours, up until that point, it's still very much a voluntary assessment. And why should you go ahead and get a voluntary assessment? Well, we know that um, when the DOD is considering awarding contracts, one of the biggest things that they need is some sort of indicator that you have the cybersecurity practices in place that DFAR 7012 mandates um, to justify receiving their data on your system. And so one of the ways to pre-vet yourself is to go ahead and get that certification, which is good for three years. So as you are going into not only new acquisitions where you want to be highly qualified and and putting yourself into that differentiator of, I've already got my CMMC cert, will highly qualify you for a lot of bids because it's one less thing the government has to send DIBCAC to review your uh, full implementation of DFAR 7012. Um, so from the government standpoint, that's less effort to make a contract award on their part. So that is going to behoove you. It's also gonna be a differentiator if you want to join a, a primes team um, more and more because the onus has been put on the primes to vet their own supply chain, their own not only subcontractors, but the vendors in their supply chain, the more and more they're sending out these questionnaires. Um, the questionnaire will be a very simple issue if you can say, I'm CMMC, you don't need to ask any more questions of me. You don't need to do an assessment. I don't need to have any more assessments. I've got it done at the top level and here's my cert. So um, these voluntary assessments, they're calling them the Joint Surveillance volunteer, Voluntary Program. Um, but essentially what all of this is, is the C-3PO's have now been 
released, <laughs> so, so to speak. When we got the CAP process, it's kind of like an IRS auditor getting their own, how do I audit a client? They got their own process for how we audit you know, our, our clients when, when somebody brings us in for a full-up assessment. Once that CAP came in, it released the C3O PAOs to start doing formal assessments, which means the, the gun has been shot. A lot of people who want to get through this process as early as possible can now start their own process. I will say one thing from talking with one of the C3 PAOs in the ecosystem that I will mention. There is a another tier that if you get a full-up assessment right now, it has to go through another tier, higher level approval. And they're only approving those packages at a rate of two packages a month up at the top levels of the CMM CAB. So just to note, if you do go for a voluntary assessment now, there is a bottleneck that's happening at the very top. We don't know if this is gonna change over the next few months. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it, this is actually a big deal. Um, this is one of those things where things have broken loose. And, and when you take a step back from looking at things, you know, there's there's all these chicken and eggs in this process. We need to have get companies assessed and certified. We need to have some sort of baseline of information. There's a learning curve as we continue to go through these. And then at a certain point when these rules go into effect, you want to have some sort of at least minimum level, if not a critical mass of companies that have been through the process. This is all about kind of getting that part started and getting piece, pieces moving. And, and there is a learning curve on all of this. Even with the cap yesterday on that call, they talked a little bit about the fact that they understand there's areas that need to be clarified in there. They've heard that loud and clear. There will be adjustments as they move forward, but they've got to get these things moving in order to have that learning curve and get that experience. And so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about you know, if, when you get to that point as a as a company and you start, want to do that voluntary assessment, what should you expect? And so, um, when you sit down with a C three PO, and especially now that they've got their cap process, they've got a very prescribed uh, methodology for performing these assessments. A lot of this is built off of kind of the formalized process we've already seen with the DCMA DIBCAC team. Um, this process will be no different if you've gone through a DIBCAC assessment. Um, and those of you who have gone through a DIBCAC assessment, if you've already made it to the other end of that, this voluntary assessment should be a piece of cake for you after going through that. So, and I think Bill can, can talk a little bit more about that, having been through a few of his own. Um, yep. So typically the C3PO team, um, you know, they may have two to four assessors. It really depends on the scope of your environment. Um, they're typically going to have an assessment lead, much like the DIBCAC team. Um, the assessors want to see, want to be able to both interview you and review your documentation. So I will say that if your documentation is not together and ready to present, um, you might get kicked out of the assessment because they'll they'll come say, okay, send us your SSP, send us your program. They might take a look at several of your documents um, with the C3POs. We went through them in a Teams meeting and said, here's some of our documents so you can see that we do have our materials together. Um, if you don't appear to have all of that, they may say, you're not ready to start your assessment. So come back when you've got all of this. Um, it'll typically begin with a kickoff meeting. Um, they're going to look through an overview. Um, they're going to look through your SSP to start with. They're going to interview you. They're going to look through your environment as well because physical and environmental controls, I mean, just locking your doors. Do you have cameras? Do you lock your server's room down? Um, all of those things really come into like a physical site survey assessment. Um, they're going to um, observe your controls. And I think to, uh, that Bill has a lot of input on sitting behind his engineers and you know the multiple screenshots that they had to go through. And I'd like to hear some more of, of what Bill has to say on that. Um, and then the next part is something that we help all of our clients with, and that's that thorough documentation review. So it's important to note here, if you're walking in with the bare minimum of the package that you survived with for DFAR 7012, it won't be enough. So Having an SSP in a poem is great. It's a great start, but that is not what they're going to assess. So you definitely need to show that you have an incident response plan. You definitely need to show that you have um, all of the security control families for DFAR 7012, NIST 800-171, 
and that you have written a set of policies and procedures for each one. They're also going to look through a lot of other things such as um, evidence and artifacts, and I'm going to let Bill talk a little bit more about that. But all of this needs to be in front of the C3PAO so that everything is ready for them to assess and you're not wasting their time while they're in there because obviously the the more time they spend, the bigger the bill you're going to get. So you really want them to come in, review everything and get out. The, the other thing that I'm going to mention, and then I'd like Bill to kind of really talk about his experience with this, is when you go in, this, the environment scope that you provide them becomes really critical and how you defend that environment. You know, I always talk about the massive swimming pool. If, if your sectioned off CUI is in the same big swimming pool as everything else, that is what they're going to assess. If you can prove that you've built your baby pool and the baby pool's outside of the swimming pool and nobody can get to the baby pool unless they walk over the deck and they're they're crossing through their barriers, that's when we know the CUI enclave, if you've built one, is sectioned off. If you've decided to go, okay, everything in the environment is now approved for CUI and we just did it across the board, that's going to be a larger level of effort because now they've got to scan everything in the environment. So those are the things you need to keep in mind. Absolutely. It's, you know, our our experience on that, on going through it with the DIBCAC side is is really, I think, you know, expected to be at least comparable. A couple of big pieces in there that you hit on, the scoping, you know, really lock down your, your system boundaries. Make sure, again, you know, are you in the big pool or the kiddie pool? Uh, and, and if you're in that big pool, that's not necessarily good or bad, but just recognize what you're signing up for there. If you have a a complex environment in your corporate environment, data enclaves start looking really, really attractive. If it's all straightforward, maybe not such a big deal. Uh, the other big piece is that alignment in between the documentation and your configurations. Yeah, I, I started that example earlier. If your policy says my computer goes to sleep in 15 minutes, your config better be 15 minutes or less than that. You know, make it 10 or wait eight or whatever. If it's 20, you're gonna get dinged because it's not as restrictive as what your policy says. Really simple example, but that theme follows throughout the whole process of your policies, should, I should say your, your configuration should be more restrictive than your policy set. So that kind of sets your bar, your border, how you deploy that better be, uh, you know, at least that level or better. Um, the, the the procedure standpoint, that, that process standpoint, there are a lot of places in there where Again, I use that that new onboarding uh, example. There are a lot of different places in there, and especially in that change control space. How are you using that? How are you tracking that? How are you documenting everything? It's so one of the things that we're institutionalizing on our side is is really making sure that our day to day world and processes are always working towards setting up those artifacts so that we can be ready when our clients get through get to that either voluntary assessment or in some cases a DIBCAC assessment. So I'm gonna shift gears now again a little bit, talk a little bit about CUI itself and some things that are kind of going on behind the scenes in contracts. Um, you know, our title here is when is CUI not CUI? But before we jump into that, uh, just for clarification, Christine, can you talk about what SP uh, prop in is, define mm -hmm. that, and then we can kind of get into the topic itself. So what I'm seeing and why I wanted to really discuss this today is um, there, there is not, and even as I see questions popping up, you know, CUI is not well-defined. Yes, it's not well-defined. And even furthermore, when you think you know the CUI registry, clarifications come out from NARA itself, uh, clarifying things that are marked as CUI are not in fact your CUI. Um, so I wanna kind of clarify some things I'm seeing over and over again on some of my client sites. Um, so we're seeing a lot of marking of the contract documents as CUI SP ProPIN. So what ProPIN is, SP stands for a special category that's under a basic category. And the ProPIN is proprietary information. Now, we don't have, as of right now, official FCI markings. So if you have contract, federal contract information, there's no markings to designate that. So right now, a lot of what the government is using is markings that 
let the government know that they're trying to protect data that you consider proprietary. Typically, ProPen we see used with proprietary uh, business systems or proprietary business information that is sensitive or confidential to the business itself. And typically, the business itself might be putting this SP ProPen on it prior to sending to the government so they can tell the government, hey, protect my information like you want me to protect yours. However, to be utterly confusing to the rest of us, um, NARA has clarified in two different manners, and I'm going to show them to you here, that CUI SP ProPen is not actually CUI as per the definitions of what NARA has provided us. So go back one. Oh, sorry. The, the first one is NARA issued a clarification under a stakeholder um, Q2 agenda in 2020, is my proprietary information CUI? They stated the government will protect it as CUI and may even send it back to you marked as CUI, but it is your proprietary information and not the government's and is therefore, because it's not government information, is not CUI categorically. The second definition, if we'll go to the second slide, is um, out of the original 32 CFR definition. So they state under the CFR definition, if you read through the full thing, under section H, they say controlled unclassified information is information the government creates or possesses, or that an entity such as a defense contractor creates or for possesses for or on behalf of the government. So in other words, either they create data that's considered CUI, like controlled technical information, they will mark it and send it to you, but you might generate it on a contract. So let's say it's assembly drawings for um, something specific, you're building a missile component for the DOD, you're creating that assembly drawing. So because it's government data, you're creating it against, you must mark it as CUI. However, CUI does not include classified information, as we know, or information a non-executive branch entity possesses or maintains in its own systems that did not come from or was not created or possessed by or for an executive branch agency or entity acting for an agency. So, in other words, it does not include your proprietary information. It does. It is not considered CUI, even though the government, when you send it to them, such as rate information on a bid, you may send this document to them. I have even seen cases in which they say, okay, fill in this form on an approved accounting system. It's pre-marked as CUI. Um, and so we've had a, a bear of a journey trying to determine First of all, how can they pre-mark a blank document as CUI? That doesn't seem wholly right. Um, all, the other side of this is, is they've just spent two um, times here defining that your proprietary information is not CUI, even though they may put a marker on it that it is. So if you go to the next slide, um, some things that we've done um, to kind of handle this. Um, so. Technically speaking, if you were sending this data, you are considered the data originator. Um, per the government, what they issued, it really shouldn't be categorized as CUI because it's not the government's data. However, as they stated in the stakeholder quarter two of 2020, the government may then mark it when they receive it. Why are they doing that? Because they understand they need to protect your information on their systems, much like they want you to protect their information on your systems. So understand that you know they may mark it up when they get it. Now, the stance that we've taken is you can decontrol it because you are the data originator. This is your data and it's not being given a technical CUI, but you need to coordinate that with the contract officer or other contract authority that you are coordinating with to say, to issue that explanation with the two quotations that we gave. Um, if the documents are pre-marked by the government, um, try to go through a route where you request to remove those markings. You can give uh, those clarifications to them and see if that, that works. And by all means, once you send them the document, if they want to upmark it on their side, they certainly can do so. Um, if they mark it as CUI when filled in, I think that's a little more appropriate to do because you should never be 
marking a blank document. Um, but if it's SP Propen, again, NAR has already claimed that this is not in fact CUI. So yes, I acknowledge this is all confusing. I don't make the rules. I'm trying to clarify them for everybody. Um, and because again, there's no official markings for FCI, you know, right now from the contract authority's position, they're stating, well, how do we protect their proprietary information? These are the only tools in our tool belt to do so. Um, so again, they can mark it appropriate. You can choose to unmark it when it gets back to your system. The confusing part for my clients is they're sending it back to me marked as CUI. Is it now CUI on my systems? The answer is no, because it's your information. Um, CUI is actually a government label for government data. Um, and this doesn't fall under that category, even if they put that marking on there. Perfectly clear. Not a problem. Easy, easy stuff, right? Um, it, it, there's a certain irony there that the, the government has the, I guess, the good intentions to protect your data, but yes. the only vehicle to do so is to put a CUI label on it. So when they send yes. it back to you, there's kind of those unintended consequences on there. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and, and let's also remember that it's your intellectual property. If you care about that enough to call it such, then you should care enough about still protecting it and securing it and probably do a lot of things you're going to do anyway, even though it doesn't have that label, it still has a value and probably in some ways more value to you as an organization because it's it's your sort of special sauce mm -hmm. in terms of the way you do work, whether that's pricing data or technological capability or anything like that as well. Um, and, and I'm always amazed at the level of detail you get into these things. I think that's one of the great things you do with your clients is, you understand all these nuances and we've had so many stories and conversations around where you go to bat for your clients to help them mm -hmm. get that clarity from the government so that they know what they need to do before they even get to system boundaries. What's the data I'm trying to protect over there? It's so important and so incredible. Right. Um, so as, as we, as we kind of absorb all this information, kind of get to it, uh, let's let's talk about that near and long term strategies as as a as a contractor as an o, o, eventual or maybe current o, OSC I guess it is organization seeking compliance. Um, you know what should folks be doing you know today next couple months and then maybe even a little further out. And I'm going to lay out the near term and then I'm going to hand it over to you for the far term because that you're far better at that than I am. <laughs> What I have done with my clients, I have a lot of clients that come to me and say, hey, great, we won this contract and they need an SPRS score like next week. Um, and we've had this so often now, we have a bifurcated strategy that taken simultaneously allows you to end up where you're going to end up, but gives you a near-term strategy to get a successful SPRS score. So we've used multiple tools. I usually call out Cocoon Data because it's one that I work with a lot. Um, again, I don't get paid anything to, to call out any products or anything. I'm, it's just something I've used that has helped me um, achieve some near-term compliance. You can certainly use um, some other products that are secure file sharing out there. Um, but what, what's interesting about getting a secure file sharing program uh, if it's compliant up to the level of data that you're doing, I use Cocoon Data because it is certified up to the ITAR level. So I have a lot of clients that say, I've got CUI, I've got ITAR, where do I put it for right now? Because I don't have an enclave built out with, with C3 and, and you know it's going to take them a few months to get everything that I need. How do I do this now? We stick in an enclave one and an enclave two solution. Enclave one is is inheriting a fully compliance environment and everything needs to make sure you're meeting encryption in storage, okay. encryption in transit. And this particular solution I usually employ, it's using um, a browser with SSL encryption. They do employ FIPS 140-2 so you can meet that. And it lets you meet about 45% of all of the NIST controls. And keep in mind, that's about the technical controls that you can cross off. The rest are up to you. So you may start out with like, hey, we've got almost 50% of the controls taken care of by inheriting this enclave. You still need to write your SSP and POAM to it. But you can get a near-term score that's probably going to make your contract officer a lot happier. Um, while you're doing a far term strategy, which is, you know, we go anywhere from three to six months, depending on how quickly you want to move into that, uh, to six to nine months. And that's where I turn it over to Bill. 
Absolutely. And, it, you know, you're right. It, it's we, we do run in the clients who are I, I have a very small footprint of data. I have a very small put, footprint of defense business. I've got an immediate need. Someone wants to send me a, a task order next week and I've got to check some boxes to get to a minimum level. And that that near term strategy, that cloud share really starts to be a good, quick answer to be able to keep things moving through your process. As those as those kind of aspects start to change, as you do more and more DOD work, as more and more people get involved, as it becomes more and more core to your business, then you kind of outgrow that somewhat quickly from a from a viable area, and and that's when we start talking about how do we how do we put your entire environment or at least a portion of your environment in a more compliant posture. A lot of folks start with a data enclave, and if you have a smaller percentage of DOD business relative to your, to your overall book. That makes a lot of sense. If you're all DOD all the time, a lot of folks are going all in on 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 kind of this strategy because they know it affects at least 50, if not all of their organization from a business standpoint. And what that typically means when we sit down with a client is we take a, a technology-based approach that usually involves some form of the government cloud. I mentioned earlier, we're very much Microsoft-centric because we really love the way they they've really consolidated so many of the things you need to do into a single platform and that gives you a lot of a lot of capability under a single umbrella and you get a lot of confidence that you know you don't have a bunch of point solutions you're trying to get there that that time frame you know in a small data enclave six to nine months makes sense if you're all in that could easily stretch to 12 12 plus if you're a manufacturer and you have the additional burden of a large on-prem footprint with operational technology that's going to add more complexity as well but the important parts to understand here is if you're looking at six to 12 to 12 plus months to be able to go from standing still to being in a compliant posture and we're looking at this starting to seep in the contracts in nine months you're already a little bit behind you should really be putting that strategy together and talking about you know what do i need to do today how do i start planning for the future even if you may not need an assessment for 12 15 24 months you need to be kind of positioning yourself now because you're going to need time to get there. Um, and, and I think it's also important to remember, we talk about CMMC, but there is DFAR 7012. There are other regulations out there that you need to hit. It's not just one target. There are multiple targets and some of them are incremental to one another. Data sovereignty is always the biggest one. If you're dealing with ITAR, nuclear secured information anything else that requires data sovereignty your your target's going to actually be cmmc plus because you're going to have that added requirement of data sovereignty with your data there it will add complexity but there are plenty of solutions in, that we work with every day that will satisfy those requirements and i will state with itar that really has been the bane of my existence with all of my clients it's absolutely uh, finding where it's flowing um i will say that there are particular users within the organizational structure that are probably letting it flow anywhere and everywhere and those tend to sit in the sales office from what i've seen there's a lot of you know purchase orders that go back and forth and and it's also why my strategy of of kind of having a two enclave strategy. One of the reasons why I keep the enclave number one in play, even when you've built out everything that we have, Bill, is because it provides an easier place to secure and share documents. And a lot of these ITAR documents, what I've seen in various manufacturers is they're sending a whole ITAR document just for somebody to take a reading off of it. And something like the secure file sharing program allows you to, you send a secure link, you don't send anything through email, it just is a secure link. You give the other person a license to log on. Both ends are encrypted with FIPS <laughs> and encrypted SSL. And so only the people who have access to that file can open it, but the sender can say the receiver only has read level access. So that means they're not downloading that ITAR onto an endpoint device or another network or a vendor who hasn't been fully vetted to be compliant. So they can read it, they can take that one reading off or those two readings off, you know, and then they didn't have to, what I call dirty the endpoints of, you know, even, you know, whether it's our own systems or I have a lot of manufacturers that have manufacturing operations all over the globe. And, you know, I would much rather the ITAR lives and breathes in one environment that's fully locked down and not, yeah 
you know, get sent to multiple lower tier vendors and we don't know their state of compliance, that has been the hardest thing for me to address. Absolutely. I mean, the you know, you're, I totally understand that the the complexity of the business issue there, and and we'll 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 foreshadow a little bit on some additional things that we're putting together, and it's all about that supply chain and and understanding what can you share with vendors, how can you share it with them, and how do you keep track on who you're sharing it with as well. Um, so that's there's definitely a lot we could spend geez weeks on that uh, <laughs> talking about it. So the as you go through this whole process, I mean, we, you know, we, this is one of those areas where we complement each other. We have a very technology forward approach. You have a very documentation forward approach. At the end of the day, you need them both, and they both need to be in alignment. So let's talk for a second about what, what's the type of documentation you should have ready as you start positioning yourself for either a DIPCAC or a voluntary assessment. So obviously, those of you that have the DFAR 7012 already know there are three top things you have to have. And if you don't know this, I'm gonna go over them again. System security plan. What What is a system security plan? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but right now let's talk about it as a plan. What are you planning to deploy? So let's say you have both the near-term and the long-term strategy. Um, what we do is we get together, you know, with with both environments, the developers for both environments, or Bill as the managed service provider, and we start putting together how do we answer all these controls in a forward-thinking approach. What is our plan? What is our roadmap? Now, what backs up against that plan and that roadmap is your plan of actions and milestones. So the plan is just that; it's a plan. Here's how we're going to do it, and the plan of actions and milestones is. That all sounded great, but here's what we haven't done yet. <laughs> and here's our milestones for closing out each of these controls. The third thing that you have to have is an incident response plan. If you don't think that's mandatory, go back and read DFAR 7012 again. You have to have an incident response plan. Um, something we provide our clients is really a plug and play incident response plan that has forms and metrics and what is an event versus an incident? You need to know that internally before you even run a table tap exercise. Um, the other thing we build out, and I think it's important to note, um, include the NFO controls, the non-federal organization controls. Uh, there's about 60 of them. They're, they are required in Appendix E. Most people overlook them because they never read down to Appendix E to know that DFAR 7012 says you must put into place NIST 800-171. They didn't just say the 110 controls of CUI controls. They said NIST 800-171. So a lot of people overlook that the 60 NFO controls are your baseline. They're your foundation before you build the house. Building the house is building that enclave for CUI. But if you don't have the foundational level controls, you can't build the house on top of it. So uh, when we go through and look, all of these policies and procedures are what we build for our clients, including I scoop out the, the system security plan requirement actually derived from 853's PL2. I scoop it back into the planning um, section where it belongs. They had actually scooted it into um, security assessment. Um, but when I write these for my clients, I make sure like all the PL controls go back into PL. The other thing you need to have, and Bill noted this when he talked about the DIBCAC assessment, when we talked about the voluntary assessment, you have to collect two pieces of evidence per control. So what does evidence mean? Um, I usually like one of each thing, either a system security plan or a policy statement to show that we've written something down. And then the second piece needs to be hard evidence, uh, configuration, screenshot, um, your, your spec sheet for your firewall showing it's FIPS 140, and then maybe further demonstrating you have the FIPS 140 module actually enabled on your firewall. So those sorts of things, um, and, and a lot of this comes down to, as far as evidence, uh, what is the C3PAO gonna wanna see? Much like when you went to college, what did your professor wanna see on the test? Um, so it's always good to discuss these things. If you are paying for an assessment to be done, ask them what they want to see to make sure you are collecting the correct evidence and go by the assessment guide. Um, there is a reason why not only NIST 800-171A, which is kind of, it's, it's a reference source for NIST 800-171, and A is the assessment guide. 
you also have the CMMC assessment guide. Use both of them. And when you're stuck, go back to the 853 controls for more granular information. That's where everything was derived from. Those are the three sources I use for all of my clients. Now, the other things that are good to have, always, I even if it's not a hard requirement, I always make my customers do a business continuity plan, also called a COOP plan if you were in the Army, um, disaster recovery plan, which should kind of hang off of your business continuity plan. Things they're going to want to see, like rules of behavior, acceptable use policy. I like to stick in there a mobile device management policy, definitely a risk assessment report for the risk management family, um, change control board forms. So Bill mentioned how configuration management is one of those overlooked families, but it ends up being a really critical family for like baselining your software and your hardware and making sure you have a consistent build. Um, this really does play into formalizing a process so that you don't have malware trying to install programs, you don't have unauthorized users trying to install programs. Um, configuration management is really, really critical. They will look into that. Um, systems interconnection agreements. So let's say there's a part of your organization that's maybe a sub-tier or it's a subsidiary business unit or it's just external, but you're hooking the two networks in together, you might want to create a systems interconnection agreement. You'll see that in access control. And then re some really good cybersecurity training for users. You can get that from third-party sources. You can build your own. I suggest a hybrid of both. Wow. Uh, there's so much there to, to, to do. There's so much information there, but it, it is all fundamental to make sure that you're, you're protecting your environment and you know what you're configuring and deploying on every side. Um, I know you covered a little bit of this. We're getting a little late in time, but I want to make sure we just covered that idea of a system security plan. If there's see if there's anything extra you wanted to kind of add in here. And and I think I kind of reviewed this, but but keep in mind the system security plan. A lot of people build it to what they've deployed, but the system security plan is your future roadmap. And then you should be aligning your POAM to close out those controls. So those two those two products go together what you will be doing. And remember that the system development life cycle, your systems, you are always injecting new servers, end users, endpoints. There, The system lives and breathes. Compliance should live and breathe with it. So you should be looking at your system security plan every year, making sure you're adhering to what you're planning and making sure you're closing out your POAM items as you go along. Now, note that if you don't have a system security plan, you're not supposed to score yourself for the SPRS score. That is, is actually a prerequisite in the scoring metric, and it tells you to stop scoring yourself if you do not have an SSP. So you have to do the SSP first, then you can proceed with the score. Good stuff. Cool. I know we're starting to bump up to the top of the hour. We do have a few minutes left for some questions. I think it's a good time. We'll, uh, we'll bring Karen back in and and let her uh, hit a couple questions. We will, from what I understand, we have a long list of questions. We probably won't catch all of them. Uh, we'll figure out a good way after this to to uh, either address folks e either individually or or maybe do a, a little bit more of a consolidated summary for folks that are on the uh, on the event itself. So, uh, Karen. Hey everyone. Yeah, we do have a lot of questions. Um, so just to, as Bill said, if we don't get to your specific question in this few minutes we have left, please know that I have copies of all of them and we'll make sure that we address them in a follow-up. Um, I think one really potentially quick question that could be answered is just some clarification on, Christina, what you were talking about with respect to CUI. So mm -hmm. one of our, um, uh, one of our, our participants asked, um, sorry, let me get back to this here. Uh, let's see. I said, I, I promised I would clarify it. Um, it was a question about, um, I'm going to, it, J-I-R-A, Jira, Jira, Jira Confluence or Bitbucket, um, whether that it are CUI assets. And I believe, Christina, based on your response, about um, what the government marks as CUI, um, that uh, the answer to that is no, that those are uh, those are not CUI assets. Is that it, correct? 
when we talk about scoping, I have to go through every client scope to determine what they're actually storing on those systems. So it's not something I can state outright for any given client yet. Yes or no, it's in scope or out of scope. That's a part of like, when we do it with our clients. We do like a phase one, stage one, which is called scoping. And that's where we look at the CUI data flow through the entire organization, the systems, and then we determine what's in scope and out of scope. Anything that touches CUI is going to be in scope. So, you know, I just want to make sure that's clear without doing a proper analysis for this particular organization, I can't make a determination one way or the other. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, also, in general, we've had a couple questions on, you know, just information, detailed information about CUI. I know in the past, Christina, if you've had some good resources, um, can I assume that we'll be able to send those out to folks after the webinar um, with some additional information? Yeah, I can send out some of the ones that, that uh, we referenced here today. Um, and certainly, I would encourage you guys to go back. I don't know if, Karen, can you post a link to our FCI and CUI primer that sure we can. did? When, when, when did we do that, Bill? A few months or, or a year ago. Um, uh, that is one of the best resources I can give you. I do this for my clients. Uh, if you want a private FCI and CUI primer, you can contact me directly and we can set up a time to do that. But I would go back on the ones that we've already recorded and we can send that out as a link. Great. Yeah, yeah we'll be sure to do that. That webinar is currently on our website, but I'll uh, send a link around to that when we send out um, a, a link to this webinar um, along with those additional resources. Thank you. Yes. Uh, let's see. Some next questions on, um, let's see, One uh, at, at the beginning of the webinar, um, one of our participants asked, once CMMC and once you're CMMC and NIST 800-171 compliant, do you have any suggestions on how to state this on their federal capability statement? Um, so, you know, this is a matter of marketing, right? When you go to bid a contract, um, if you are compliant, it is no really no better right now than a self-attestation. If you have had a C3PAO at least do a provisional assessment and you have passed and you have a definite score by a C3PAO, I would post that um, usually you know, either in your management section um, or if you choose to do it as a part of your technical section to show that you are storing government data under a certified boundary. Um, you can do that. Once you get the certification, it will speak for itself. And what they have stated is once you get your CMMC certification, um, I think they're in between products. They originally talked about EMAS. The last um, decision point I said saw, I saw said EMAS, but I happen to know from inside information, it might be another system that we're going to be posting the full uh, assessment and documentation in. Um, once they do that, it says it's going to update SPRS with that certification, and that will be living in the ecosystem for your contract officer to review prior to award. Now, I will also mention there was a question on there asking about recompetes. I consider if there's a new contract number, it's a new contract even if it's a recompete. So if that contract number changes and it's not just an extension of the existing contract, you may see from an older contract to a new recompete, if that's a new contract number, Number one, consider that if you get a new contract officer, you know, all bets are off. That may not be a contract that was run similar to the way the predecessor ran it. Number two, um, as new requirements are popping up, while they might not have put it in the existing contract, they might have been chomping at the bit for the last two years of that previously performing contract to put it in the new one. So when they go to recompete, don't be surprised when you see CMMC pop up post the final rule. Wow. All right, I know we're getting up close to the top of the end, uh, to the hour. Uh, Karen, let's do one more, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap things up. That sounds great. Um, okay, so I guess a, a question on GCC High. Um, so Mark asked, doesn't Office 365 GCC High just add another environment that they have to document for CMMC compliance? Our ERP, MES, PLM, QMS all want us to use their cloud service. Doesn't each one just add another CMMC headache? Yes. Uh, uh, anytime you are adding another application, another system into your system boundary, 
you are expanding that system boundary. You are you're expanding another vendor that you are going to go and need to to work with that vendor to understand what their capabilities are. Uh, you know, ERP systems, operational technology, are are kind of their own their own kind of hornet's nest a little bit. An easier example might be CRM and financial systems. So we look at 365 as your foundation from a security standpoint. Not only does Office 365 handle your your email, your your document storage, your collaboration capability, your 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 Teams capability, but when you go from Office to Microsoft 365, that's when you're layering on the security stack for a lot of the basics of your information of your environment, how you are accessing cloud apps, how you are protecting your endpoint devices, uh, foundationally how you're doing a lot of your endpoint monitoring, especially on devices and mobile mobile phones. Uh, and even if you start looking at things like Azure Sentinel, Azure Seam, how you're collecting all of that data, we look at that as a foundational element. And then every component you add on incrementally on there should have some ability to kind of pot tie into that. Uh, but there are certainly other vendors to consider. You know, the financial apps, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the cloud services now have a GovCloud version. They've done all the work to keep their infrastructure and get their inf infrastructure in alignment. Take advantage of that. CRM systems, if you choose between, say, Salesforce and Salesforce Gov, choose the government version. They're going to be fed ramped. It's designed for these things. It's going to solve a lot of your a lot of challenges. And that even goes back to 365 with the differences between commercial GCC and GCC high. What data are you protecting? What are your contractual requirements? If you have CUI data, if you have 7012 in your contracts, 7012 is going to push you in the GCC. As soon as you get the data sovereign material with, G so with stuff around ITAR or other types of components, that's what's going to push you into that GCC high capability. So, Christina, want to add in on that or? Nope. <laughs> Great. I think we are out of time. <laughs> we, are, we are absolutely out of time. I'm going to do a quick commercial um, for a couple of webinars we have coming up. Um, if you're in GovCloud or you work with folks in GCC or GCC high, probably the most frustrating thing that you've dealt with in the last few years is the ability to cross collaborate across those clouds, to be able to, to access or share information from commercial and the GCC high. Uh, great news, that's getting solved. There are things that are rolling out that are in preview right now. Uh, actually tomorrow at two o'clock, we're doing a webinar with Rich Wakeman, who's really well known from the Microsoft side of the house. He's gonna explain what all that means, what is being rolled out from across collaboration cross-cloud collaboration capability. Uh, I'm super excited about this, super fresh, super interesting content about what is available and what is coming down the pike and really literally being released as we talk on those pieces there. And what that's gonna do is set us up for another webinar that we're gonna do in a couple of weeks with our good friends over at AFPOINT. Uh, Jay Lease is gonna come in and talk about, you know, besides this cross-cloud capability, what can we give, do above and beyond the out of, out of the box capabilities to protect that data um, and do some different, some really cool things with their product set? Because you know we've been talking about, hey, I want to share data across cloud, share data, share data. Well, great, now we can share it. Now we've got the problem of controlling it. How do you keep folks from inadvertently sending data across cloud that maybe they shouldn't do it? This is a big step in that in that product set and solution set that we're building for that. And then we're working on a third element of this series to talk about how do you take those mitigation strategies and tie it into your vendor management programs. We've got some really great content in, in the pipeline for that that's going to be not far behind there. Um, Christina, once again, thank you. It's, it's always a pleasure. It's always great doing these things with you. I learn stuff. Even after we go through the practice and we go through here, I'm like, okay, make some notes. That's, we got to kind of talk through that, follow up on it. So Always such a pleasure working with you and doing Thank these things. So much, but, uh, Karen, I'll let you uh, I'll let you wrap it up. Great, thanks everyone, and thanks again. Um, I answered a number of your questions um, privately. Uh, I know we did not get to all of the questions. Um, you can be sure that we will put together a compilation of the questions that got asked, and we'll have uh, both Bill and Christina weigh in on responses. Um, as we noted, we'll also send out links um, that are really useful, especially with respect to CUI, um, the webinar that we did previously on this, um, all great resources. 
Um, and uh, at the end of this uh, slide deck, you'll find uh, email information for both Bill and Christina, and I encourage you to reach out to them with anything to follow up with. Um, lastly, we'll send out registration links for those two cross-cloud webinars that we have scheduled in case you're interested. Um, we'll basically send you everything except the kitchen sink, I think. So <laughs> thank you again uh, to everyone joining us. And please be sure to hang on the line just for a minute to answer our survey at the end. And uh, hope everyone has a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.